question of how to access coastal storm hazard data from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers uh, coastal hazard system. Uh, so here is the website. You can find it by just doing a, any kind of internet search for USAC, USACE coastal hazard system and it should come up. Otherwise, it, it is chs.erdc.dren.mil, um, and then note that it is a secure HTTP, so HTTPS. But that's the link. This is the website that it will bring you to. Um, there are a couple different uh, links here at the top that kind of describe what this is um, and some of the features. Um, I won't go into detail on those. I'll just kind of do a very streamlined tutorial of uh, how to interact with a website, uh, how to select uh, your uh, study area and your storm event or your study of interest, uh, select and identify data, download the data, and then we'll very briefly look at the types of data, uh, what you might get uh, by completing that downloading process. Your, uh, your mileage may vary here, so to speak, but I like to search by study. Uh, I don't know that it makes a huge difference. Um, Ultimately, you can get to the data that you need by using any of these three icons, but I'm going to search by study. Uh, when you click on that, the next thing that it may bring you to is a kind of login screen. Now, it's, it's bypassing that for me because I've already been through here today, uh, but it might bring up a screen that asks you for a username and password, but next to it, there will be a button with a, a kind of a, a icon or a character of uh, a person's profile image and it says guest user just click on that guest user button if you get a pop-up that says something about uh, authenticating through a certificate just click cancel or no do not authorize the the authentication through a certificate or else it's basically going to lock your browser out from accessing that site um, which you can recover by clearing out your cache and your cookies if that happens but it's just easier to click no cancel or ignore um, if you get a pop-up menu about an authentication certificate so just keep that in mind um, this big disclaimer on the screen is going to prevent you from doing anything until you acknowledge it so just click the X button uh, sometimes the website is slow to load um, it also can be temperamental in terms of the browser that you are using um, I'm using Chrome right now, um, Google Chrome, and in fact, uh, an old version of Chrome that desperately needs to be updated, uh, but it seems to be working okay today. Once you're here, the, next, the first thing you need to do is select your study. Uh, for my research group, um, we are most likely going to be selecting the study for the South Atlantic Coastal Study here um, because we want, we probably want data in the Gulf of Mexico, perhaps even specifically for Alabama. But if you're looking for data in other locations, uh, there are other study data available within the coastal hazard system, say from the North Atlantic Coast Comprehensive Study, which went from Maine to Virginia. Uh, then there's also down here the USACE Sabine to Galveston uh, data set. So that's gonna be some of the Texas coast, a lot of the Texas coast. And there are some old legacy data sets in there as well. Uh, but we're going to focus on the what's called the SACS or the South Atlantic Coastal Study data. So select that. And then the next thing you need to do down here is apply a filter to the data sets that you actually want to view. So nothing's going to be shown in this little uh, map viewer uh, on the other side of the browser until you actually apply the filter. Now the SACS study is broken up into three regions. So there's uh, Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Uh, we don't need any of that, so I'm going to disable some of these there's at least one selection in each study region by default um, after you select the SAC study um, I think it's wise to just not show the things that you don't need so I'm going to deselect the default selections in these regions um, that we don't want to you look at so the Puerto Rico and US Virgin Islands if you need something there obviously you need to enable it but we don't for this example we're going to look at something in Alabama it also means that we don't need the North Carolina to Southeast Florida data, so I'm going to disable it, turn off that selection. Down here, Gulf of Mexico, so that's going to be Southwest Florida, uh, like Naples, Marco Island area up to Mississippi. 
uh, and you've got these options here that you can select from. And if you hover over the I icon, you'll see what these data sets contain. Um, by default, the base conditions are going to be selected. Um, so this is, these are going to be storm event simulations using the AdCirc storm surge model and the ST wave wave model. Uh, these base conditions do not include tides. For the Gulf of Mexico, that's not really a big deal because our tide range is very small. The base conditions also do not include anything related to long-term sea level rise, so no sea level change. So these storm conditions were effectively simulated on what you could assume to be more or less present day sea level. Within that database, there are over a thousand synthetic tropical cyclones, or what the system abbreviates as TC, and then over 70 historical extra tropical cyclones. So these are non-tropical events, but other major storms that had an impact. Uh, these are abbreviated in the coastal hazard system using the designation XH. And the TC and the XH will become relevant here in a few minutes. Uh, notice that you've also got base conditions with tides uh, for some of those extra tropical events. Because they're extra tropical, which means like by default board definition non-tropical, um, have including the tides in those might be more important because these are going to be slightly weaker storms. But those weaker storms may have produced maybe a storm surge that's on the order of magnitude of the tides. Um, so including the tides in those allows you to maybe look at kind of some uh, low level inundation and flooding uh, from storms that might happen pretty often. Uh, but, but not flooding at kind of extreme magnitude, so to speak. Base conditions plus SLC1 uh, represents those base conditions. So the over 1,000 tropical cyclones and 70 extra tropical storms in, on a elevated mean sea level that is 0.83 meters than the higher than the base conditions from the, the default data set. And then again, SLC2, that's going to be a mean sea level that is 2.24 meters higher uh, than what we consider more or less like present day conditions or whatever those conditions were when the base conditions were simulated. Notice here that there's a little uh, hamburger icon that'll show you kind of the things that are going to be included or are optional to be included in the results for each one of these selections. And then there's also a statistics column over here uh, that's going to show you that the basically the data sets that have conditional probabilities um, in them. So some sort of return period or exceedance probability statistics. So the terminology here that the system uses is AEF or annual exceedance frequency, which we can think of as a proxy for return period. Um, so it's gonna give you annual exceedance probabilities for significant wave height, which is that HM0, for the peak wave period or TP, for the still water level, which is SWL, and then also uh, conditional annual exceedance frequencies, which we're not gonna talk about. We wanna focus on the AEF for the significant wave height and the AEF for the still water level. Those are the things that fundamentally, for the most part, are gonna drive um, the things that we're interested in studying um, from a coastal engineering perspective. Peak wave period might be important if you're trying to parameterize or set up a model to maybe simulate something that looks like say like a 100 year or a 500 year or a 50 year return period event. Uh, but for, for our specific purposes and why I'm recording this screencast now, the peak wave period is not all that important. So um, that's just something to keep in mind. If, if I don't talk about it again, that's why we're, just, we're not really worried about it right now. So once you have identified the data set of interest, and for this, can, just to keep things easy, I'm only gonna show the base conditions here. I'm gonna click apply filter. Uh, and then once that little symbol here goes from red to green, um, that tells me I can start zooming in on my study area of interest. And um, I'm going to zoom in here to Alabama. And so these three states that are shown, well, that were shown in yellow in the previous zoom level. Um, so this is because I only have data selected in the Gulf of Mexico region. So those are the only states that get highlighted as in containing data in those regions. And the more and more you zoom in, the more and more feature rich uh, the, the, the view becomes. And so now it's kind of breaking it down into these, these weird little hexagonal cells of which you, um, data are available. 
I've never really figured out the color coding here. It, it might be related with the spatial density of the points. I'm not really sure, but it doesn't matter. The only important thing to know here is that you've got to zoom in uh, quite far until you get to the actual data points. Uh, so each one of these little orange dots, orange single circles or symbols, is a, a node in the numerical model mesh or grid, you can think of. So the structure that we use in the model to solve the system of governing equations. So at every single one of these little points or nodes, um, the users um, who deployed and ran the models uh, saved and archived the model outputs or results at each one of these points. So what you're seeing here is actually um, kind of the spatial distribution of information uh, where, where the model was run. Uh, and you'll notice that in places, um, you know, kind of over land and on barrier islands, the point spacing is much closer together. And then the further you go offshore, uh, where not much interesting things are happening, uh, the point spacing spreads out. Um, so this is a, AdCirc is run on what's called an unstructured mesh. And so you can change the resolution uh, to have more points where you need them and fewer points where you don't need them. Uh, so that, that explains the clustering here. If you were to continue to zoom in more and more, so you can identify an individual point, let's just as an example click on this one right on Dauphin Island. Uh, you'll get this little pop-up menu, and there's not a ton that you can do with this pop-up menu um, other than maybe just visualize some things. Uh, but as an example, for the annual exceedance frequency, if you want to look at a distribution of exceedance probabilities for, say, the still water level, uh, you can click on this little icon here, and it will pop up give you this figure. Uh, so this is annual exceedance frequency. Um, so this would be essentially a one year event here for 10 to the zero, 10 to the minus one would be, uh, you know, every 0.1 years or so one over 0.1. So every 10 years, this would be every 100 years. This is every then 1000 years and so on and so forth as you go out um, to uh, smaller and smaller numbers here. And then this is the still water level in meters relative to the North American vertical datum of 1988. And you'll see that because these were derived from statistics and probability, and their probability distributions about these, um, the summary statistics, you have the best estimate, which you could think of as the median, the 50th percentile. Um, so that would be like the most um, frequently occurring value, um, if you will. Uh, and then it also gives you the confidence interval about that. So 80% uh, confidence range. So it goes from the 90% confidence limit down to the 10% confidence limit. So if you take the difference between those, you've got a confidence interval of 80% or confidence range of 80%, which we assume is evenly distributed about the median value. So essentially 40% above the best estimate and 40% below the best estimate if you think of it, that best estimate as the 50th percentile. So you take half of the range, you know, 80, and divide by two of 40. If you add 40 to 50, you get the 90th percent, 90% uh, 90 confidence limit. If you take 40 and subtract from 50, you get the 10% confidence limit. So if we were to, interested in the 100 year return period water level, um, so something that has an annual exceedance frequency of 0 0.001, um, then we're looking at this range of values here. So there's an 80% chance that the 100 year return period water level at that specific point on Dolphin Island without sea level rise is somewhere in between like maybe 2.4 meters and 4.2 meters or something like that. Uh, the other way to think about this is there's a 90% chance that the 100 year return period still water level would be less than four point, less than or equal to maybe 4.2 meters. Uh, and then maybe only a 10% chance that it would be bigger than 4.2 meters. Uh, and there's a 50% chance um, that it could be more or less than about 3.2 or 3.4 meters. So that's how to interpret this information. But you can also recover this digitally in the form of tables and spreadsheets. Um, so let's kind of go back in time to the, our previous uh, image here. And in this pop-up window, you can recover the tabulated information by clicking on the little table icon. And to believe it or not, um, you have to experiment with this a little bit, but uh, I have determined and verified that you can copy and paste these values um, 
if you, so if you select them and either if you're on a Windows machine control C control C to copy or right click and copy or if you're on a Mac then command C and if you then open up a spreadsheet and then go into a cell and do right click paste or control V or command V and you might need to do a paste special um, you can eventually get this stuff to copy and paste into cells in a spreadsheet but again, this is only doing it for one point. So if you want to do it for an area of points, this would be prohibitively time consuming and very inefficient. So there's a different way to do it. But if you're interested in just knowing some site specific values, um, this is a very easy way to get to those answers. And again, you can do the same thing for your significant wave heights. Uh, again, here from a definition standpoint, significant wave height generally means an average of the largest 33% of the waves that occurred during that event or would or could occur during that event. Uh, and again, you can get to a tabular, uh, for an, a tabular point of view or from the graphical point of view. And again, for the peak wave period. Uh, the conditional probabilities we're not gonna worry about right now, um, but then like ad circ, um, you can recover uh, wind pressures, velocities, uh, water velocities, uh, water levels, and then the SD wave is going to give you, um, you can get depth information, and then the wave heights, uh, wave direction, um, and wave period, uh, things like that. Um, and then it, if you click on the details tab, it gives you some uh, specific information about like uh, the data points or ID uh, of that specific location that you clicked on. But if you actually want to download that data, what you would do here is you would click on the down arrow here so the arrow pointing down so if you click on that it's going to bring up this window uh, you need to identify so select the value of you know the, the point that you have identified that will then enable this other tab up here called downloads to open up and as you're scrolling through here you're going to see essentially two files um, a number of files related to each type of storm simulations that they did uh, two for the storm surge model adser, two for the wave model ST wave. Um, each one of those then corresponds to peaks, so the maximum value that was obtained. So for adser, that would be the maximum still water level, and then for the ST wave, that would be the maximum largest significant wave height. You can also get the complete time series from each one of these storm events, and so this is going to produce very big files that you need to be aware of because remember for the XH or the extratropical um, cyclones, the historical extratropical cyclones, which is the XH, there are only about 70 of those. So you're going to get, in this file, you'll get 70 peak values, but in this file, you'll get 70 time series values. So times the time series for each one of those 70 events, and the time series persist over multiple days for the model simulation to basically model that storm event. So these files can get pretty large, um, especially for the other ones that we're gonna talk about where you have thousands of uh, synthetic tropical cyclone events. When you start down downloading those time series files, um, they get very large very fast. So just keep that in mind. So you're gonna have two files, peaks and time series for AdCERC, two files, peaks and time series for the SD wave model. If you come down here to the tropical synthetic uh, cyclone events, that, that was one where we had over a thousand of those. Again, two files for AdCERT, peaks and time series, two files for uh, SD Wave, peaks and time series, and then you're going to get uh, two additional files down here for your annual exceedance frequency values and then the conditional AEF values, which again, we're not going to worry about those. But imagine you just wanted to you know, download everything. You could select the um, header up here, uh, or you could just select values individually um, if you didn't want to download everything. Like if you didn't need, if all you needed was the conditional probabilities, you could just come down here, select that, and then you can download it in a proprietary format called HDF5 in a CSV file as both, and it could also include the hazard curve graphics that you saw me demonstrate earlier. Um, and it, you, basically you would just click either download both, download CSV or download H5, and then either keep this box checked or not and it would only download that. Um, imagine rather that we wanted to download all of this stuff. If we did this and then select, select to download both, uh, what's gonna happen here is 
Um, I'm not going to wait for this in real time because it takes a while. Once you click one of these three buttons, H5, CSV, or both, you're going to get this pop-up menu that says, hey, we're working on your files. We're going to compile it into a zip file, and then it'll download automatically. So you can clear this out, click OK. You can also clear out this menu, and it will still keep working in the background. Um, this does take a while because these time series files are quite large. Um, but I've already downloaded that file, so the magic of movie making. I'm just going to go to my downloads folder and extract the zip file and immediately go into this folder. And you'll see that all the CSV files uh, that we just went through are in there. So you've got the annual exceedance frequencies uh, for all of those events. You've got the, uh, the peaks in the time series for the wave model for the synthetic tropical events, the peaks in the time series for ADSERC for the synthetic tropical events, and the same for the extra tropical storms. Uh, peaks in time series for both AdCirc and SD-Wave. Um, you also get your curves uh, for your still water level, your significant wave height, and your peak wave period at that location. Uh, and then you also have uh, a readme file over here which explains what's going on. Um, I think uh, when I downloaded this, I only chose to download the CSVs. I did not do both. Uh, which is why you do not see the HDF5 files in here. Keep in mind, if you didn't already know this, that there are some programs like MATLAB that can natively open and read HDF5 files. Uh, and somewhere on that CH, CH, CHS website, uh, you can download a tool, a uh, little MATLAB script that they already have developed that will help you read in those HDF5 files. Uh, but if we wanted to just kind of open up this uh, annual exceedance uh, probability data file, um, we can open it up and we see that basically, remember this is all for just one point, uh, but we've got here our significant wave height values um, for our exceedance frequencies, and then we've got our peak wave periods, and then we've got our still water levels, uh, and then keep in mind here that across the top, we have the best estimate and we have the confidence limit at 10%, at 16%, at 84%, and at 90%. So it does give you two additional confidence limits for those values. Now notice that these are years to the minus one. So this is one over 10. Um, so this is something that would happen extremely frequently and it's ill-defined in the statistics. So sometimes for some of these uh, really high frequency events, they're not well defined by statistics and you won't actually have any values. And so that's not atypical. Um, the way to interpret these is like, if you take one divided by this number, that's essentially the return period. So if you're looking for the 100 year return period, you would come down here and divide one by 0.01 and you get 100 years. So remember, this is years to the negative one. So one divided by years. Um, so, Let's now think about this in the context of downloading a spatial field of data um, from which we could interpolate and create a, a hazard raster or uh, a grid of hazard information. Instead of identifying a single point, you're gonna use the data selection tool over here. And it can either be a polygon or a circle or a square. And I'm gonna use a square and I'm just going to drag my square over my area of interest and what that square is going to do is it's going to go grab and identify all of those orange data points that are in my square that I just defined uh, and it's going to pop those into this menu. I'm about to tell you something that you're not going to want to hear which is that uh, unfortunately you have to go through and select these one by one. Um, so you then need to select the, the values that you want to download if you want to download everything, you can just click this box. However, the problem here is you're going to get way more information than you need. So I recommend sorting um, essentially by the type of file that you're trying to recover um, and then only downloading the stuff that you really need. Uh, so as, as an example, we really only need um, the AEF values for each one of these points, right? So. But there are hundreds and hundreds of points that were inside of that box. Um, but 
but we want all of those. Um, so we, there's stuff, of course, that, that we don't need, uh, but but we do need all of this, uh, these AEF data. Um, so if we select that, we're gonna select all of our points of interest that we want first to enable the download button. And then once we get to the download tab, then we can start doing some things to maybe more cleverly arrange our data so it's a little bit easier to sort through. And one of the ways is by sorting by um, one of these columns. So really what we're looking for are, let me scroll back up to find it. Ah, okay, there it is. We're looking for these. So this is what we want to get to to define our hazards. So we want those annual exceedance frequency values. So if we want to just basically sort by these, we can take and drag this column up here. And what's going to happen then is, if we scroll all the way back up to the top, it's basically going to allow us to basically collapse all of these things and find the stuff that we're truly looking for. So this is, the, this is the one that we're most interested in, right? We need the exceedance probability values for wave height and water level uh, to do the fragility analysis, such as is the case of the specific example for which I'm recording the screencast. So you would need to go through and, and click on all of these points. Um, and again, this is kind of unfortunate news because there are a lot to click on, but it won't take you more than a few minutes to click through these. Um, so you keep scrolling down and you'll see that it basically just goes all the way until the next menu. So I've tried all sorts of combinations like control shift down, click, not click, no control, no shift. Um, and I know that there's probably a clever way to highlight all these and identify them, click them all at the same time. I haven't figured that out yet. Maybe there's a better way to sort it, maybe you figured out, um, but you would select all those uh, and then go back up here and, and select the appropriate button <laughs> that you need, whether it's the H5, the CSV, or maybe even the both. Um, but yeah, if you click the, the primary box up here, it's just gonna select everything, uh, which, which you probably don't want to do uh, because for downloading anything more than maybe a few points, um, it's gonna bog down and uh, it might crash your browser. You may never get a compiled zip file uh, with all that information. So. Uh, you'll need to go through here and select the points that you need. And then once you do that, you'll, you'll click the button up here and, and download what you need. Fortunately, I have actually, again, the magic of movie making. I've already done that process. So I'm going to go unzip that file and dive in there. And for that one, I actually did download, just for the exceedance uh, probability values, both the H5 and the CSV values. And the reason why is... Um, when I'm reading these into process and grid all this data, it's probably going to be easier to write a MATLAB script or maybe a Python script if you're a Python programmer uh, to read in these files and organize your data. Um, and so I, I wanted to give myself some options about uh, how to do that and what that might look like. Um, so to grid this information, to kind of do a little thought experiment of stepping through this, what you're fundamentally going to need to do from here on out once you have all of these points inside of your selected area of interest for Dolphin Island or wherever your study area it is, whether you're going to read in and use the CSV files or the H5 files, um, you're going to want to have a script that basically sequentially opens up or consistently or um, I don't know what word I'm looking for, but you know, basically repetitively maybe is the word I'm looking for, open up each one of these output files from all of your selected points, identifies the latitude and longitude, so we know the location, uh, and then specifically grabs the return period frequency of interest, or maybe all of them, uh, to make it easier, uh, for your wave height and also for your still water level. So basically we're gonna need in a MATLAB or a Python script to open this up and then save and catalog all this information. That way we can then interpolate it onto a grid and create a hazard raster for Dolphin Island that we can subsequently load into NCore. Um, so you're gonna need to have a way then of reading in all this data so we can organize it. And I actually do already have a MATLAB script that will do that. 
Um, so we will be able to make some more process on that. But before I turn over all of the candy in the candy store, um, I wanted you all to be able to figure out how to access this data, uh, see what they look like, and then kind of maybe be able to think through uh, some of the uh, potential hurdles that you're going to run into it in terms of doing something with these data once you have them. Um, again, um, it's, it's going to download the, those return period plots for every single one of those points. Um, so this, this becomes a fairly big file with, with lots of information in it. Um, and then the, the readme has some technical details about the files and the file structures and the file types. It also tells you kind of some, you know, key metadata, if you will, about um, the data that you're looking at. And then also has some naming conventions in there that are important. Um, the path lookup might be very helpful if specifically you are um, trying to code this up and automate it, um, but it, it may also not really be necessary if you just work from within one of these files. So next steps here, thinking about specifically our project for Dolphin Island and Incor is taking and ingesting all of these CSV or HF files HF, HDF5 files that have our exceedance probability values for wave height and water level, tagging those, organizing them, and assigning them to those spatial locations, and then spatially interpolating those to a regular grid from which we can create the hazard raster. So those are the next steps. Uh, and again, I, I've got some tools that will make that process easier. Uh, but uh, I, I would like for maybe uh, you all to, to think through that process yourself um, and, and figure out what, what that process might look like, the tools that you might uh, use to accomplish that, uh, but then note that some of these tools already exist. Uh, so that's going to do it. Uh, I'm going to close out the screen recording now, and uh, we'll get this posted in the shared Google Drive so you have access to it. Good luck.